Well, hello, everyone. It is the uh, Gary Neville podcast, which comes from the Etihad Stadium in the immediate wake of the Manchester derby, which Manchester City have won by three goals to one. It was for a good while, Gary, a really good contest, actually. But in the end, that kind of city certainty had its way, didn't it? Yeah, um, it's the result, probably it's the result that everyone expected before the game. And it was the probably scoreline that, you know, 3-0, 3-1 was my sort of not great at predictions, but just felt that that would be the type of scoreline. But the Rashford goal early on just got me out of my seat for one. Um, and it just meant that Manchester United had something to hang on to. And look, it was a different Manchester United today. I think that we've all been really critical of them in the last couple of months, even when they've been winning. And they've won quite a few games in the last, let's like, say, month or two. But the way in which they've been conceding lots of chances, they've been so open, they've been so easy to play against, has been startling to watch. Actually, today, I thought that they were a compact unit of 11 players, including the goalkeeper, that were really sort of, if you like, well-drilled, well-organised. There's obviously a change been made. They didn't have a centre-forward, or they chose not to go with the centre-forward. Rashford, who can play there, was playing wide, and they decided to go with Matt Tomney and um, Fernandez, obviously, in those positions. So it's a very different Eric Ten Hag setup today, but one that was respectful of City. And one that actually at the end of the game leaves you in a position where when you're trying to analyse a game, you're not stood, you're not sat here thinking, well, they were a disgrace today. You're not sat here thinking they were a mess. You're not sat here thinking they were all over the place. You're sat here thinking that they're playing against obviously a world-class team and that they're actually quite ro- resilient and quite sort of, if you like, yeah, well-drilled in sort of shuffling across the pitch. They could have been a bit more aggressive. The one big thing... I think is that the 25 minutes at the start of the game, they were counter-punching. They had a little bit of quality to play through and they had some legs up front with Ganacho and Rashford running forward from Anana's kicks. After 25, 30 minutes, I'd say to the end of the game, they just did not attack at all. I mean, from the second goal going in, it was just all City. But they really didn't punch. And I think what we saw from Chelsea a few weeks ago was that in the second half, as well as the first half, they did put the guard up for large periods of the game but then they did throw the jab they did have a big you know big hit every so often and United lost that so if you're going to play deep defensively you still have to have that counter punch every five ten minutes that just gives City a little bit of a wobble and makes them think hang on a minute but they were so overwhelming City in that second half they were so sort of sustained in their attacks that that'll be the disappointment for Eric Ten Hag today that they didn't go and score that second goal because they didn't even attack after the first one really I mean, for, for every visitor here, an hour and a half yeah. seems a long, long time, doesn't it? And a, a lead, almost, it's, it's not inconsequential. It's a wonderful, wonderful goal from Marcus Rashford. But you know what's going to follow it, whoever you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never played for United in too many games like that. Um, obviously, Pep wasn't in. Um, Pep wasn't in the league when I obviously was playing, but I played quite a few games for England where we were pushed back in a sort of narrow 4-4-2 shape and we were playing against Portugal or Brazil or Spain or teams like that that would just keep the ball off us and it's just draining. I don't know, it's just like a constant sort of like, I said part way through the second half, you're almost wanting them to shoot, you're wanting them to cross it because that's a chance you can win the ball back. You haven't got the energy to get up to the ball because they've played a million passes and you've just run around and sort of try to sort of stay in your shape and not sort of give gaps in between you, in your defensive players. So I've played in lots of games like that for England and it's demoralising, it really is. And United, United were hanging on. As soon as City got that first goal, you thought, well, look, there's half an hour to go here. And like you say, half an hour, you said 90 minutes is an age. Half an hour is an age when you're playing against that City team. So how good's Phil Foden? It's not the first time that question's been asked, but I mean, are we lucky to have him in England? He's a sensation. And I think that, I think that obviously England have got, you know, Bellingham, they've got um, Foden, they've got Kane, they've got real talented players, but... Foden for me is something really, really, really special. And I said during the last World Cup, if we can't make room for Phil Foden and can't build around Phil Foden, we're struggling. I feel that, you know, Gareth has done a brilliant job, but he is something that is completely different. He would get into any team in the world, Phil Foden. Um, and we need to put him into his best position, whatever that he feels that is, whatever the coach thinks it is, they can collaborate between them. So, yeah, I think to, for City, Pep Guardiola... I think he he got him into the team, he pulled him out of the team, he got him into the team, he pulled him out of the team for a year or two and you wondered whether you know, he was ever going to really cement a position. But now, you know, he, he, he's there, he's in, he's, he's in concrete. Uh, and today, I, I, 
for me, the, the, the Derby games, the Liverpool games for United were always emotional games, and I always felt that you know it was difficult for homegrown players to really keep calm. But he's he's so cold. He just looks like un completely n not phased by anything. His temperament is amazing, uh, and today he's he's single-handedly gone and sort of, if you like, got City back in that game with what is a world-class strike to start with. But the little one too, round Casemiro, who falls for it and he just can't get near him, is is brilliant because, like you say, that's it's a classic sort of little move. But he just pops it one side. Alvarez gives it him back and he finishes. It's simple but beautiful. In terms of that calm and composure and, and not getting carried away with the emotion that you spoke about, um, d do we understate how good Manchester City are at that, actually? Because lesser teams, if they are 1-0 down to their big rivals and there's nearly an hour gone or whatever, you know, you, you sort of see that patience dissipating. But they don't just talk no. the talk, they walk the walk, don't they? They just keep on doing what they do. Yeah, it's methodical. The rhythm doesn't change. Like you say, you want them, to, as an opposition player... You want them to shoot. You want them to get panicky. You want them to get desperate. You want them to cross from st stupid areas. But they don't make mistakes on the ball. And they punish you and punish you. It's almost like a constant jab. Just going right through the middle of you and right through the middle of you. And then all of a sudden you'll get the hit. And it, it, it's just, honestly, it's so difficult to do what they do. You need players with patience, with, with technical ability, tactical understanding of where to be. They test you continuously throughout the game very rarely let you off the hook, show no signs of desperation. It's Pep Guardiola's style of play. At times it can be in some games a little bit like, here we go again, we know what's going to happen. But then, then the chasing the game down, it's punishing to the opposition team. And we've seen today, I mean, Chelsea hung on a couple of weeks ago here, but that could have been 3 or 4-1 you know, on another day. And today it has been 3-1. So you've got to admire what City are, what they do. They're the favourites for the title. They've got big games coming up next week as a big test for them at Anfield. But it looks like they're sort of starting to get into the stride, the period of time in the season where they start to enjoy it. And, uh, yeah, it's ominous. It's ominous. So next week coming up, in the context of Liverpool, who, of course, had to show a lot of patience, even more, 99 minutes worth of patience yesterday. Uh, what, what do you want to pick off the bones of what happened at Nottingham Forest? <laughs> <laughs> I think just going to next week, and Arsenal, obviously, a couple of weeks later for City, to, to change, to make this monumental change that you need to take on a team like City and, and, and damage their belief and their confidence, you need to beat them. I think Liverpool and Arsenal need to think about those games. I'm not saying go out and charge at them for half an hour and panic. I think you need to beat them. I always thought when, say, Arsenal won the league um, against us, they came to Old Trafford and they didn't just go and get a point. They shocked us. They shook us to the ground. They went and scored over Mars, Will Tord. Was it Will Tord that yeah. scored that goal? And then you think of when Chelsea beat us, I think, under Ancelotti. I think that they, you know, Mourinho's first game when he won his first title at Hockey, they beat Manchester, you know, they beat us. I always think if you're going to go and win the league and you're going to go and damage the sort of mentality of a proven champion, you've got to go and do it. You can't rely upon other teams and think, well, they might drop points here, they might drop points there. Liverpool and Arsenal both have. Manchester City in the next few weeks and they can't look upon anybody else to help them they have to go and win and I strongly believe that not necessarily because that a point isn't always a good point against Manchester City but to change the belief in this stadium in Pep Guardiola and what exists here where they feel like they're going to win the title Pep's already told us they're going to win the title you have to do something big you have to do something big to shift that belief and I think that I'm really looking forward to the next few weeks I think all three teams Arsenal at the moment I think in the last five have been the best in terms of form they've won the last five games they're performing the best I feel they've got the best defensive record Liverpool have got the energy and the momentum but City have got the sort of experience and the know-how so it's a really intriguing time but from yesterday you know driving home from Salford already a little bit down and then that goal went in and he said Nunez has scored I obviously hadn't seen at that point the uh, the controversial moment um, what I would say about I think it's important to talk about that goal first. There was a lovely little bit of movement from Nunez just to connect with that McAllister pass, that little look up from McAllister. He just sees him and then he has to clips it in. But just watch Nunez's little run to make that little sort of dart in behind. And I sometimes think of Nunez as not being the smartest, not being the most subtle in his game. But that was a really good goal, that, and a really sort of good striker movement. Obviously, the big moment was the referee and talking point. I mean, that's kind of done, isn't it? I, there's nothing we can add to that. It happened. It, and It's interesting, Peter, because I, 
Mike was there obviously talking before, and I saw his interview before the game today, where he described it as a monumental error. And I watched it and I thought, yeah, there was. there's no doubt the Nottingham Forest player was just in possession. Um, and, that you know, there's no doubt Nottingham Forest should have got the ball back. But the goal came a minute 50 after. I mean, two minutes in football is an absolute age. So the idea that it was a monumental error, because obviously it was a decision based upon, obviously they got the law wrong. I get the fact it was a, it, it was a, it was a, a mistake, it was a frustration. But I get the feeling now that we're making sort of what would be, I think, a run-of-the-mill error that's, you know, something that you might see, you know, quite regularly in a season as being described as almost like a massive, massive thing. Um, it's, and look, the, 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 the sort of the, the owner on the side of the pitch and the sort of Clattenburg nonsense, I, 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 I can't, I'm not, I can't have that. I just, I can't buy into it is what I mean. I'm, I, can't, I can't have it, it's nothing to do with me, but I just can't buy into it at all. I feel we are pushing... Um, and we are pushing the sort of, if you like, boundaries towards, I think we're inciting potentially not just more anger and hate towards referees. I do genuinely feel at some point it will become quite dangerous. We have seen referees attacked in this last two or three years. And I generally feel now some of the actions of the clubs that they're taking, you know, you can't complain about a refereeing decision that was 1 minute 50 before you can see they go, 1 minute 50? I mean, it's like, well, fair enough, 5, 10 seconds, I think you'd be fuming if they came up the end of the pitch and scored. But I, I, to me, yeah, look, it's an error. There's no doubt it's a mistake. There's no doubt Nottingham Forest would have the ball and then the, the pattern of the game would change. But we don't know that Liverpool wouldn't have gone up the other end and scored in a different way. Liverpool have got that something about them at the moment, that that momentum that I talked about before, which tells you that that you know is a lightly, lightly thing to happen. So, look, we don't know what's going to happen in a football game. I just think at the moment, we just need to sort of probably show a little bit of restraint. I don't feel it's as bad as, as everything. I mean... I get it, the fact that Notts Forest are under pressure. They're going to potentially get a points deduction that's going to drag them right down towards Luton and the rest. Um, so I get the fact there's panic and there's, there's desperation. But in some ways, right, where we actually felt sorry for Nottingham Forest a few weeks ago because they were getting the sort of work, getting the rub of the green, they're almost grabbing defeat from victory the way in which they're going about it. You know, Clattenburg's all over the radio and they're talking about, well, we don't know whether we're going to make an official complaint yet. And what do they want? Do they want a replay of the match? I mean, this is where sort of this season seems to have taken it, that teams just don't seem to accept that they might get a bad decision against them. You know, in, in, the, in the day, and I'm talking about in the day, I'm talking about last year, you know, if you think about the... the there was the one, uh, actually, Manchester United, when Manchester United won at Old Trafford against City, and the offside one, do you remember? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a bit of a bad one, actually. You know what I mean? It affected, obviously, City at the time. There was no sort of like at that time from City we were on the other, it was on they were on the there was no like sort of like, oh, let's replay the game or let's do this or there seems to have been this season this angle that there's almost like retribution or revenge needed or some sort of greater action rather than just thinking you're going to get a shocker at some point against you in football everyone has and I don't think that was even a shocker yesterday it was a bad one but it wasn't a shocker. A human error is a part of sport. That's, yeah. that's, well, we that's saw a... Erling Haaland today, <laughs> yeah, didn't we? Yeah. I mean, imagine if City, for some yeah. reason today, obviously they win the game in the end and they deserve to win, but imagine if if, if City draw this game 1-1 and lose the game by a goal at the end of the season or two points or whatever it might be. Yeah. And Erling Haaland yeah. has sort of missed that chance. Obviously, that he gets the goal in the end and City get the three points, but you know, that's a for him a big human error you know what I mean it's as bad as it gets for him in terms of missing either he'll have felt terrible probably still will even though he scored last one because I think they want you in the studio yeah. don't they um, is it just people like me romantics who talk about the game or is it a real thing in a dressing room that when you get a 99th minute winner like that you think hang on this really could oh. happen. Is that genuinely a kind of turning oh. moment potentially in a dressing room? Oh no it's the best way to win a football match by a million miles I mean and I go back to that treble season, which was 25 years ago for us. And I think of the last minute winner against Liverpool in the third round of the Cup in January. That was the beginning of it all. Coming back, it, there's two things. Coming back from behind to win demonstrates resilience is a great feeling. But scoring a last minute winner, when you just know that you've let the, left those fans leave in the atmosphere at the end. Of course, you love to win 4 0, where everyone's sort of wandering off before the end because they think, well, we've won, we can go home. They're nice as well sometimes because you don't want it to be a sort of emotional roller coaster every week but the last minute winners are some of the great the greatest things that you can experience and um 
Yeah, I mean, what Liverpool did in that cup final last week and then what they've done this week, the belief and confidence that that will give them, knowing that they've got players to come back, oh, it's monumental. That, that they, They've got momentum, they've got energy, they've got that sort of passion, that spirit with them. Can they keep it riding? I mean, what I would say is that there's an international break to come that's going to sort of take a chunk out of the season and sort of two weeks break where the, you can come back differently after that and the feeling can be different. So it's a bit early, just a touch early to start thinking you're in the home straight we're not the reason I'm thinking it's more important at this time is just the nature of the games because Liverpool play City and Manchester United play Manchester City so this game next Sunday ahead of the international break is big uh, because of the fact that you know you've got the two of the big teams playing against each other and it will because City don't lose a lot of games you've, you've got to think this is a monumental big game next Sunday um, but you, I think when we come back from the internationals is when it really goes into that running. But the big, the, the last-minute winners are there's something that you know. I thought that Oscar Bob goal at Newcastle that City scored that night. I thought, oh, that was the that was the night where I thought when they start going anything and they're coming back from, you know, they come back from goals behind quite a few times. And you'll know the numbers in the last sort of two months they've been coming back from behind quite a lot. When you come back from behind and you score goals in the last minute, City have done it, but also Liverpool are doing it. It counts for a lot. Arsenal are going through a good period at the moment where they're winning games, you know, I think, you know, well, and that'll happen. But they'll need those big games where they come from behind. When they come here, it'll be fantastic. It'll be really fantastic to see Arsenal come here because it'll be a proper game, that. You know, today we've not seen a proper game, really. For 70 minutes, we've seen City just batter the door down of United and eventually get there. Um... What we'll see, I think, with Arsenal, you'd think, and next week at Anfield, will be, I think, more of a competitive, equal game. You know, Manchester United just below those two teams at this moment in time, unfortunately. Well, that sets the context beautifully, Gary. So, uh, Anfield next week. Look yep. forward to it. See you next week. Thanks, Gary. Thank Cheers.